Washington, D.C. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome all of our panelists and you, the audience, uh, to this uh, session. Uh, obviously, we are uh, trying to give a quick analysis and reaction to the dramatic events uh, of this past weekend. Uh, uh, the panel is titled The Geopolitical Implications of Iran's Attack on Israel. Uh, obviously, this has been in the headlines uh, for a good 48 hours now. And I know that many are also tracking what the potential Israeli response uh, to the Iranian, Iranian uh, weekend attack could be and how that could further uh, complicate and create uh, risk in the region. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined by a number of colleagues uh, here. Uh, allow me to introduce them quickly. Uh, General Mike Nagata is a distinguished senior fellow on national security at MEI. Uh, he retired from the U.S. Army in 2019 after a long career uh, of active duty and uh, uh, also served in the U.S. Special Operations. His final position was director of strategy for the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, we're joined also by my colleague Alex Vatanka, who is the director of our Iran program, uh, who's written many books, uh, hundreds of articles, follows Iran closely, both its domestic politics and foreign policy. Uh, joined also by uh, Mr. Nimrod Goren. Dr. Goren is a senior fellow for Israeli affairs at the Middle East Institute. He's joining us today from Israel. He's the president and founder of MITVIM the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies, as well as a number of other uh, initiatives. Uh, joining us as well is my colleague Hafsa Halawa. She is a, currently a non-resident scholar at uh, the Middle East Institute. Uh, she covers uh, many issues in the Middle East. She's based in the Gulf, joining us today from Dubai, uh, also covers uh, Iraq very closely, and we'll hear from her uh, about that. Uh, and uh, joining us as well is my dear, dear colleague, uh, Brian uh, Katulis, uh, Brian is a senior fellow for U.S. foreign policy and a senior adv advisor to the president, which is me, at the Middle East Institute. And we work closely on uh, uh, on foreign policy research issues here at the uh, Institute. He was previously uh, at the Center for American Progress, where he built the Middle East Center there. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, the audience, for joining us as well. Uh, let me mention that uh, for any questions, uh, please put them, if you're on Zoom, put them in the Q&A function. I will try to keep uh, an eye on the Q&A, on the, the questions coming in, and uh, put them into my conversation with uh, our panelists today. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, please send your questions by email to events at mei.edu. That's events at mei.edu. So let's get right into it. And General Nagata, let me start with you. You have long military experience uh, in the region and in the U.S. as well. I know you've been following developments uh, prior to this week. Read, uh, weekend. We were all following events in Gaza, uh, but now turning our attention uh, to this uh, this development. Uh, how do you read uh, from a military per perspective the Iranian attack this weekend? What do you think militarily reading sort of the military tea leaves it was designed to do? Uh, and how do you read the Israeli and allied, let's call it, military defense, military response so far? Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be at another MEI event, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I, the, the challenge for any commentator right now is there is so much to talk about just because of the events of the last uh, 48, 72 hours that uh, it's, it, it's actually quite difficult to cherry pick what you can say succinctly, but I will try to be succinct nonetheless. I think as everybody knows, what happened uh, a little more than a day ago now is that Iran um, organized and conducted a very large scale direct attack on the state of Israel. Most of the news reporting that I've seen is that somewhere around th an assortment of 300 or so missiles, rockets, and drones were launched from a variety of locations. I will come back to that in a moment uh, against uh, the state of Israel. Um, so far, I've seen no significant reporting of major damage or casualties in Israel. Maybe that will be forthcoming in, in, uh, in the next few days. But right now, my assessment overall is that the operational and tactical effect of this attack, as large as it was, is negligible. 
That doesn't mean it doesn't have strategic, political, and other kinds of effects. But at the tactical and operational effect, this essentially was a dud. Um, that said, um, at the same time, and I'm sure this will be a topic of conversation with all the panelists, is that rather oddly, almost simultaneously with this attack, Iran publicly announced that they considered the matter with Israel now closed, which is a very odd thing to do in the, in the middle of an offensive attack on another nation state. I've never seen this before, but it happened. What that actually means, I think, is the subject of, con of considerable debate right now. And like I said, I'm sure we will get into that uh, later in the discussion. Last couple of points. Um, while I stand by what I said a moment ago, tactically and operationally, the effect of this was, neg was negligible. At the strategic level, though, Iran demonstrated something in this attack that I've never seen them do before. Uh, it set aside the fact that they'd never directly attacked Israel before. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the fact that Iran was able to integrate and synchronize long range, high technology attacks from five separate locations simultaneously across the Middle East, from, it, from their own soil, from Iraq, from Syria, from Lebanon, and from Yemen. I've never seen them do that before. That would be challenging even for the United States to do, but Iran pulled that off. My hunch is that many of my former colleagues in their offices and cubicles scattered across the US national security enterprise are trying to figure out what that means, how well organized was it really, and is this something they could do again? If this is a new ability to integrate and synchronize that we've never seen before, that is potentially a strategic game changer in the region. It gives, it would give the Iranians a degree of sophistication and reach that I did not previously credit them for. Uh, I think I'll stop there because I don't want to go on too long, but uh, hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And let me uh, to, uh, ask you a quick follow-up question. Uh, as you said, uh, a large scale attack in terms of numbers, but uh, as many reported, maybe 99% shot down, not much of an impact. Is the reading of, let's say, the military community, if I can use that term, that this is this is the balance of power that Iran, that yes, it's impressive, it was coordinated, but the defenses of Israel and the US and others you know, you could say utterly defeated, at least this attack, is this, does this show that Iran doesn't have the capability, despite this impressive coordination, that it will always be defended against in this way? Or did Iran maybe intentionally use this as just a demonstration, expecting it uh, not to have much of an impact? And hence, the, you know, what appeared like a great defense in a future confrontation might not be so effective. What's the military reading then? Um, I, my hunch is the read is varied. Um, I can imagine, and I've seen some evidence of a, a couple of things that I'll respond with. Number one is um, that the foreshadowing that Iran gave that they were going to retaliate gave the gift of time to the Israelis, the United States, and other like-minded nations who were determined to try to defend Israel against an attack. That gift of time gave what I'll call a loose coalition for the defense of Israel uh, a significant number of days to get ready. And, they, and we already knew that the greatest likelihood was that Iran would conduct what they have been doing through their proxies for the last several months, which is long range drone, missile and rocket attacks. Um, so the, the good news for the US and its allies is it had a lot of time to get ready. And that I think explains in, explains in large measure why the attack by the Iranians uh, was unsuccessful. That said, the other side of the coin is, um, the posture the United States and its allies in Israel is having to maintain to defend against a repeat of this is incredibly expensive. The amount of material, technology, manpower, and just physical and mental effort to maintain this 
expanded version of the Iron Dome, I guess, uh, is I, I suspect it can be sustained for a while, but it can't be sustained forever. And eventually the cost is going to start causing at least some of the participants to communicate, I can't keep doing this. We have to find a different solution. Uh, that's speculation, obviously, but I think it's well-founded speculation. The other thing is kind of another facet of what I just said, and that is that um, the fact that there had been these sporadic, mostly proxy attacks occurring against Israel ever since 7 October forced the United States to put a massive amount of military capability back into the Middle East. Everyone knows that we have withdrawn most of it over the course of the last several years. So I'm sure there are people in the U.S. government who don't want to keep doing this forever because we have other problems in Europe, we have other problems in the in East Asia. But if Iran can do this, it puts a huge question mark on can the United States afford to diminish the massive military investment it has had to return to the Middle East. Thank you, Mike. Very interesting and insightful. Uh, Alex, uh, let me turn to you and ask you first about your reading of the calculations of the Iranian leadership, uh, uh, you know, that planned this type of response to, uh, you know, the attack on the building in Damascus, consular or whatever it was exactly, uh, and that it is quite a huge departure for the Islamic Republic to do this, not use proxies, massive, at least in terms of numbers. Uh, what do you understand was the cost benefit, the political calculations of the leadership in Iran to do this? And what is your reading about what they might now be bracing for or you know, their position now? Uh, morning, Paul. Morning to everyone. Great to be with you. Uh, Paul, let me just remind everybody that this uh, Iran-Israel um, competition, rivalry, conflict, whatever you want to call it, is very old, goes back to 1979. Uh, it has come in phases over recent decades. I would say the last two main phases, obviously Iran arriving in full force in Syria, next door to Israel um, in the last decade was one phase. That really, that's when you start seeing the uh, Iranian-Israeli uh, proxy conflict intensifying. And that uh, proxy conflict intensifies further in the last six, seven months after the Hamas attack on 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 uh, on Israel, but in terms of why they did what they did on the Iranian side after the Israeli strike on their consulate in Damascus is very simple. I think. I mean, you ask about a cost benefit analysis. They didn't have a choice. Certainly, from their perspective, they had lost deterrence, and they were expecting more of these types of attacks were coming their way to a point where they would have had, um, you know, no credibility left. It was essentially not just about. Uh, their credibility in the eyes of the proxy network, the likes of Hezbollah or the Houthis in the region. It was also a qu question of credibility in the eyes of the small base of support that the Islamic Republic continues to have inside of Iran. You know, uh, Ali Khamenei knew that right away. I mean, we have to remember Israel has struck uh, Iran, Iranian interest in the region and inside of Iran hundreds of times over the last decade plus. Khamenei usually didn't comment. He didn't have to comment this time either. But he came out in a number of speeches. He basically limited his options. He said, they've struck us on our home, on our home soil. We have no choice but to struck back. Why did he do that? I think two main reasons. For the first time, we really start hearing serious pushback inside the regime about the values of so-called strategic patience and just relying on your proxy network to go after the Israelis, that the Israelis had taken the glove off and this was it. This was the moment Iran couldn't take it anymore. How many heard that clearly? And I think that's why he started as a cautious man as he is. And I know that might be controversial, but we, we get into perhaps later why I call Khamenei cautious. But again, to, to your point about cost benefit analysis, this was a moment where the costs were greater than the benefits in not doing anything. Now, um, I, I don't know, obviously, if this is going to recreate deterrence. We have to see what the Israelis do and what the Iranian side will do in turn. But um, I read some of the reports saying that Israel or some uh, of their officials are already thinking perhaps what they did in Damascus on 1st of April 
uh, might not, not might not have been the smartest of things to do. Uh, but we will see if if this Iranian strategy paid off or not. But to me, clearly, what was also true in all of this, and General Nagata was talking about, you know, why on earth would you give away one of your prized um, you know, uh, instruments here, the element of surprise in a military operation. They did that because they really uh, do not have the confidence in themselves to go to war with Israel or certainly not with the United States. And that was always the part they needed to get right. Retaliate, but don't get themselves into a war that, um, you know, they couldn't get out of. Because Fundamentally, I think the Islamic Republic sees direct war with the United States as tantamount to end of the Islamic Republic. I think the, the scenarios of 2003 Iraq is what comes up in their mind. So for that reason, they had to go and choreograph this uh, operation and essentially forfeit the element of surprise. They got themselves humiliated in the process. I mean, the headline is not going to be so much that I understand what the, uh, General Nagata just said, and it is, I guess, impressive. I'm not a military analyst, but striking a target from five different locations in the region is, is not an easy thing to do. But the other headline is 99% of them were intercepted, uh, right? And I want to turn that into the sort of um, bigger question that uh, might come out of all this, Paul, which is, what is it that Iran is doing right now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel? There are a couple of hard facts the Iranian regime now really has to answer for. Number one, they were on their own. They were essentially on their own. And I was curious to see that media inside of Iran, close to the Revolutionary Guards, are now openly talking about how elements in the Assad regime in Syria are essentially helping the, the Israelis because they want the Iranians out of Syria. The bigger point I'm making is the Arab world, including a regime like that of Assad, in Syria are not necessarily on board in terms of what Iran is trying to do in the region. Iran's strategic isolation, in not internationally, but among the Arabs in the Middle East, I think was, obviously with the exception of the proxy groups, was also put on display. You know, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, some of these other Gulf countries, if these reports are true, actively helped in the defense of Israel. Again, that is bound to raise questions about what it is Iran is trying to do with its Israel policy. When we keep in mind, Paul, the fact that there is no historic enmity between Iran and Israel. There is very little support in the Iranian population for what the regime is doing against Israel. And these are the real questions that are now emerging from the last couple of weeks of events. And the proxy network will now be tested. Is it actually any, any good for the national interest of Iran? Uh, is it not just a pure ideological obsession of a select few inside the leadership, but the rest of the country could just as well be fine with dropping Israel as a as a as an enemy and move on with their lives? Um, I would say one thing, and I'll stop, Paul, it, because you asked about what could come next. The Iranians are obviously awaiting that too. If I was sitting in Israel and deciding what to do, obviously they have to do something. They also have to recreate a deterrence. They also have an image and a public opinion to worry about. But I would just say some of the reporting out there talking about hitting their nuclear sites, I would say that's missing the point. The nuclear sites uh, is something, if it, if it ever happens, is something Israel wants to do very carefully with the United States. What Israel can do on its own, which I think would make much more sense and will keep Iranian public opinion from rallying around the flag, if you will, is to go after Iran's proxy network in the region. Very few Iranians cry over IRGC officers dying at the hands of Israel in the region because those IRGC officers are not exactly popular in Iran these days. So I would be very careful uh, if I was Israel and the United States making sure this doesn't become a nationalist cause inside of Iran and the regime exploits it and keep the fight with uh, with the people who are essentially running the proxy network against Israel, which is uh, primarily the Revolutionary Guards. I'll stop there, Paul. Thank you, Alex. Uh, very, very interesting and helpful. Thanks a lot. Nimrod, uh, let me turn to you and, you know, ask first about uh, how it was experienced, I suppose, in Israel. Uh, obviously, there was an October 7 experience, which was uh, very different. And then there was this experience. Uh, on the one hand, a very spectacular attack seen in the sky and so on. On the other hand, kind of a full success of the defense, no real impact. Uh, you know, the equivalent on October 7 would have been, you know, a Hamas attack 
but Israeli defenses hold, nothing happens, it's repelled, no big deal. Uh, what is the, I guess, emotional, visceral reaction experience of Israelis? And then obviously give us some insight into how you see uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, decision-making at this point, what he might uh, what he might do according to your analysis. Nimrod, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure being here. Uh, indeed, it was a new experience. It was nothing like October 7. It was something that is more within the traditional scope of national security. It was a new threat for Israel. We didn't confront such an attack before, but it is within the scenario that Israel has been preparing itself to. Unlike to the failures of October 7, here we saw that the Israeli military, together with its allies, managed to effectively and successfully confront the threat. You know, it was uh, coming after several days of unclarity. So there was this waiting period in which there was a lot of concern within the Israeli public. Uh, people did not know what to expect. People could not assess how successful the Israeli defense structure will be. Again, that scope of an Iranian threat. Against Hezbollah, against Hamas, we more or less know how to assess the chances of getting hurt. We know that the time frame is a very short one. A missile go from Gaza, three minutes later, it reaches the centers of Israel. Here it was a wait of seven hours. Okay, so Israel is basically spending the evening at home, following social media, seeing the drones going over Iraq, going over Syria, going over Jordan. Uh, so this was a totally new experience. But then it produced something that Israel didn't really sense for quite a while, which is a sense of success. So it's not only the military operation success, it was a sense of having the upper hand against an enemy about which we've been hearing for a long time. And it was about uh, being embraced in a way by the international community. After weeks of much criticism, a lot of harsh language against Israel also coming from Washington, what happened, this coordination, this cooperation with the Biden administration, with countries in the region, including Jordan, that was maybe the most uh, difficult, using the most difficult language on Israel, all of that created a different narrative, a different experience for Israelis that now basically shaped their mindset about the future action because it um, delivered the message that Israel did not do it on its own. It was a collective effort, uh, and that collective effort needs to be maintained in order for Israel to be able to confront such threats going forward and to be able to maintain this collective effort, it means that Israel needs to take into account the needs of those countries that are a part of that. And we already saw in the dynamics between Israel and the US in the weeks before how Israel kind of uh, went with the American wish list, you know, humanitarian aid in Gaza and I gave redeployment within the Strip. So Israel was already there. And I think now the understanding is that you must have coordination with the Americans going forward. You need to take into account the regional countries, but it also showed the, the strength, the resilience of regional cooperation between Israel and Arab states. Even at the time when there is a war in Gaza, still you see Arab countries basically defending the territory of Israel and taking proactive actions on their own, much more than they were anticipated to take. And this also emphasizing opportunities for the future. If that's what's happening when there is a war going on, imagine what will happen when there is some progress towards peace. What are the implications? We already saw the Saudis pitching in uh, in the context of the debate about the possible normalization process later on. So I think all of that carries some important messages for the Israeli public that now shape the calculation about the reaction. And the Israeli public is not pushing now for a major retaliation. There are those on the far right that unsurprisingly are calling for that. But the average Israelis are okay with, you know, let's wait a bit. Let's act in a surprising, sophisticated, creative manner. Maybe we should focus on Lebanon. You know, all of that is happening within a context of a war that Israel is not necessarily achieving its goals on. So maybe we can leverage that and the new military diplomatic constellation to achieve the more important goals for Israel at the moment on the other fronts, together with the countries that have joint interests like us. Uh, thank you, Nimrod. Uh, if you were, you know, you know, looking at the prime minister himself, you've given an excellent analysis of kind of how the public is feeling and reacting. Uh, it's important to say that you said they're not, there's no public, you know, clamor for a major or immediate reaction. Uh, you mentioned some of the hardliners. What would your, what would be your best guess about how the prime minister is thinking about this? Uh, as you said, maybe it's a political benefit for him. Uh, you know, the Americans and allies and even some Arab countries are in a way closer to Israel. 
because of this, uh, they agree more about Iran, obviously, than they agree about Gaza. Uh, would you expect him to be adventurous, uh, to do something right away, to maybe take advantage of the situation? Uh, or do you think he'd be more, take his time, take the win, as Biden said, both security-wise and politically? What would your guess over the next few days? Many people are worried about what might happen in just the next few days. First, it's uh, difficult to enter the mind of uh, Netanyahu, but I will try to at least give assessments on the principles. And for Netanyahu, you see a paradox between his traditional policies of being non-adventurous on big military um, warfare that Israel may lose in. Uh, I don't think he will benefit politically from what happened. I don't think the achievement in blocking the Iran attack is attributed to him. There are more uh, thank you messages coming from Israel to President Biden and to the King of Jordan than to the Prime Minister of Netanyahu. And Netanyahu basically failed again in his public conduct around the world. The weekend before, when Israelis were buying generators and uh, buying water bottles, Netanyahu went to his friend in Jerusalem and stayed in the private bunker that he has in his house. He didn't engage effectively with the public. He showed some pre-recorded message, and that was it. So Israelis did not have a leader at the time. Uh, so I think Netanyahu is within a context of his public positioning, which is a problematic one. Um, he did commit himself to respond, and it was very clear that if Iran attacks Israel from its soil, Israel will attack back. And that's like what was said before about the Iranian commitment to the mode of action. So Israel will have to do that. But I think the context now enabled him to back off a bit and to do it in a different way. Whether that will actually happen, I'm not sure. We are entering, entering Passover. And next week, if something happens, I think Israel will want to get it over with rather quickly. So there may also be the scenario of something happening within the next few days. But again, difficult to predict. Thank you. Thank you, Nimrod. Uh, Hafsa, let me turn to you. You're in Dubai. You're in the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf, you know, recently has de-escalated with Iran and tried to get out of the way of any major Iranian-Israeli or Iranian-American. Uh, fight, but it remains very vulnerable to any major escalation in the region. Uh, how have you read uh, the mood among Gulf leaders, among Gulf people? How are they reading this? Who are they blaming? What are they worried about? Uh, what are they recommending? Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you. And uh, just before I kind of, or leading into sort of a broader how the Gulf states uh, and the region has been responding, I think that we have to acknowledge that it can be very convenient for a narrative to ignore significant pieces of information regarding both Jordan and Saudi Arabia and these claims of defending Israel. You know, we've had the statements officially from the Saudis. The Jordanians have made it very clear that they will behave this way regardless of who is shooting missiles in the sky across their airspace. As someone who was in Amman two weeks ago, it is surreal to see across Amman of all places, missiles shooting across the sky. So let's you know, also temper this excitement about coalitions and uh, zero sum narratives, which I think is partly uh, the, uh, the, the, the most negative outcome of all of this is this idea that the region will succumb to a zero sum outcome Outcome, whereby one or two, one of these uh, of these powers will win out over the losses of the other. That is certainly not Gulf states' policy, or I would argue regional policy in terms of trying to de-escalate this situation. And that leads to how the Gulf states view this. And primarily, this is a region that is focused on not just de-escalation, but integration, economic integration, social integration across the entire region, every single day since October 7th in their eyes has been a complete disaster. There is no denying that. This is not a region that is going to in any way, shape or form relish in engaging in these security threats. They are directly vulnerable to proxy activity. We've seen over the years how some of their foreign policy has been responded to by proxy uh, armed non-state actors in the region. And beyond that, they've invested a lot of time and money and diplomatic effort to de-escalate. And I would argue primarily with Iran over Israel. People forget that the first efforts of de-escalation 
before Abraham Accords was signed from the UAE was to de-escalate and try and establish a detente with the Iranians. The Saudis the same. Immediately after Abraham, we had the Baghdad process. So this is about acknowledging that they need and want sustainable detente with the Iranians, and they have been quite successful in doing so. There are now some very rooted principles where I would argue both sides are very clear that they don't want to escalate, reignite conflict in Yemen and, and various other things. And, you know, with respect, part of how this is all or primarily the massive escalations we're seeing are because of Israeli aggression, be it on Palestinians across the occupied territories, not just in Gaza, but also in the West Bank and occupied East Jerusalem through the government, through the IDF, and through armed non-state actors being extremist settlers, and an ongoing conflict in southern Lebanon that we have seen to uh, sideline because it doesn't compare to 06 yet, uh, as well as aggression on sovereign state territory, whatever, and I agree with Alex, the uh, the conclusions, majority, um, or at least certainly regular discussions uh, with Syrians and, and the general Syrian mood is not necessarily supportive or, or defending of Iran for obvious reasons. That doesn't necessarily mean that either Syria or Lebanon or Iraq want to become playgrounds for this aggression to play out. And that's where we're headed. I think part of the problem for the Gulf states has been trying to find ways to de-escalate. And uh, part of the frustration and indeed concern, great concern, is that we have had six months of the United States leadership and the administration arguably ignoring all opportunities for off-ramps, opportunities to try and temper this, to try and bring or encourage and empower bringing this to an end. And, uh, you know, for many of us, certainly, this has been an eventual outcome that we've been talking about for several months. And my fear now, and I think I would, uh, it would be echoed, uh, or certainly the thought in a uh, uh, many Gulf capitals and regional capitals is how do we de-escalate this now? As Nimrod, I think, correctly points out, there will be some kind of response. And I think we're all hoping that it's arguably against proxies, uh, be it in Syria or Lebanon, that means there is no con continuous direct tit for tat in Iranian you know, state for state conflict, shall we call it. However, there's no guarantee we don't know. We haven't seen anything, I would argue, from the Israeli leadership that tells us that they will take the uh, the quieter way out of this. And, and I, I would love to, to hear thoughts from people who think otherwise. And for the Gulf, this is putting us on a trajectory of not just heightened instability, but direct threat uh, against them in their territory and their own national security. So no one is satisfied, happy, uh, you know, uh, or, or even, um, you know, anything but massively concerned at the, 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 the situation over the last six months. Thank you, Hafsa. Thank you for bringing uh, that insight, but also that pers that perspective, that voice uh, that also links all of this to what's been happening in Gaza and the broader picture uh, that we must uh, not uh, lose sight of. I'm going to come back to you to get your impressions about uh, uh, Iraq and how this is being uh, been, been seen there. But Brian, uh, thank you for your strategic patience. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let me uh, go to you. This, uh, you know, the U.S., uh, as you often say, the Biden, many U.S. administrations want to have nothing to do with the Middle East, but like in the mafia, they get they get pulled back in. You know, you can't really leave the Middle East. And as General Nagata said, now the investment uh, is uh, is big, is costly, uh, and might need to be sustained. But to walk us through, Brian, how you think the administration managed the run up uh, to what was an expected attack? Uh, the, the management of the attack itself, and what is it trying to do right now? What are the levers it's pulling? Uh, thanks, Paul. I think uh, the Biden administration uh, did something similar to what it did in the run-up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What strikes me is that there was actually pretty strong and good intelligence about what might come here. And clearly, because this was a failed and foiled attack by Iran, um, that, that bears that out. The facts bear out that um, the best uh, uh, defense here was, was very much in play. I think what this episode demonstrated this weekend is that despite many years of different voices inside the United States arguing that the U.S. should pull back from the region and withdraw and that it does more harm than good and because of its various relationships with different countries across the region, the United States remains the most influential 
and powerful outside actor. It's not Europe. It's not China. Uh, it's not Russia. Um, but that said, it still faces strong limits on its ability to shape outcomes. Um, actions, the key drivers of actions in the region come from this region. And I think this episode um, operates sort of like a MRI or a CAT scan. It shows and exposes sort of um, who's been doing what and where where things are at. And I think um, in the U.S. foreign policy debate, it's quite quite often self-absorbed. It says if the U.S. just does this to Israel or against Iran, um, that it will somehow determine those those outcomes. And I think what we see here are are different actors, different countries, and in some cases, non-state actors testing the limits of their power. And I think that's that's on on full full display here. I think the Biden team right now uh, heading into sort of this episode and even before the October 7th war really wanted to limit how much it wanted to engage in the Middle East. It was starting to do a few things and step up compared to where it was uh, two, two years ago. But but in a sense, they're in a very tactical, reactive crisis management mode. So uh, right now, I think the today the emphasis is on trying to sh- uh, demonstrate some sort of uh, restraint to, to argue with Israel that. The fact that this attack was thwarted, the fact that Iran looks actually quite weak and its network of partners um, should should be used as a period to, to consolidate a lot of the things that I think were fully on display. I agree with Hafsa that there isn't likely to be an Arab NATO or regional in, in, in security integration happening here. But it's interesting to see the tactical responses and the coordination, things that I think General Nagata and others in the U.S. military have worked on for a long time of trying to nudge along greater uh, interoperability of air defenses and doing things that essentially not only protect Israelis, but but there's a real risk uh, whenever anyone fires on Israel of hitting Palestinians uh, as well. So so I'll, I'll, I'll just close with what I think will be some things to watch for, for the U.S. approach in the next uh, couple of weeks. One, I think the Biden team still very decidedly is trying to deal with its geopolitical bandwidth challenges. It's not just uh, where we're placing our military, but it's also how much time and mental energy is being spent um, on on the Middle East versus uh, Ukraine versus uh, China and trying to keep that balance uh, correct. I think we in the Middle East and places at the Middle East Institute often think it's the center of the universe. And even though the Biden team, I think, has stepped up since October 7th, um, it's it's still trying to limit how much it actually directly engages and trying to limit sort of the, the, the damage of a wider regional war is a, is, a key, um, is, a, is a key goal. I also think a key goal is getting to uh, some form of a temporary ceasefire um, as a bridge to something longer in Gaza, right? And I, as I understand it from um, U.S. officials today, that the problem here isn't U.S. policy. And this is where maybe Hafsa and I have a slight difference of views. There, there's, there's been multiple discussions for months about a ceasefire that would lead to hostage releases. And it's, it's a complicated negotiation, but it, the U.S. officials, I, I speak with, see Hamas and, and some of those elements as being much more obstructionist uh, these days uh, on that front. And last thing I'd say, I think the one real outcome we'll see probably this week inside the U.S. system and not just the Biden administration is that the isolationists that we've seen on the left and the right um, that have held up some of the assistance, not only to to Israel, but also Ukraine and and Taiwan, seems that logjam may be moving. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson has outlined a, a complicated plan. And with this divided Congress, it's hard to. Uh, see much getting done, but it looks like some things might move forward. And I think that's important because we've had years of people essentially arguing in, in the U.S. system from, from the left saying, hey, cut off funding for the Iron Dome. Now, imagine if that were actually realized and what would have transpired if there were not those capabilities there. It, it would actually probably lead to a wider conflagration in the region. There's also those on the right that essentially have said about aid to the Middle East, aid to Ukraine and Taiwan, that we really shouldn't be doing much over there. And I think the the, the GOP has strands in it led by the presumptive uh, presidential nominee that essentially has prioritized the immigration challenge over these these global stakes. And I think that may shift. That's the thing I'm looking for this week is to see whether that tone and tenor that has held up 
a lot of the things that President Biden asked for in, in October of last year, whether that moves. So it's, uh, but, but bottom line, uh, Paul, is that I think the U.S. plays a very important influential role, but it still has limits. And one of those limits is ourselves and our own internal divisions. Uh, thank you, Brian. Let me uh, ask you a question, Brian, still uh, looking forward a bit. Uh, there will be, one imagines, an Israeli response. We don't know exactly when and what. Uh, and I think there will be a urgent need after that for powerful diplomacy uh, yeah. to make sure that that tit for tat stops there uh, and that we don't then get another Iranian action and an Israeli action. As you said, the U.S. is, you know, the most influential one, but maybe can't do it alone. Uh, but that would be uh, urgent. Also putting on the table that uh, Iran and Israel now need new rules of the game, given that, you know, they're going after each other directly. Uh, there is, you know, been rules of the game a little bit in South Lebanon. There's, you know, they're in flux. There have been some rules in Syria violated maybe by Israel going after uh, the consular type building directly. So there are there is a need for new rules between Iran and Israel. Uh, yes. It has to be engaged. Do you see a role for China, for other? What do you see a diplomatic initiative like that looking like? I, I think if it's uh, if we, we could attempt to see it be as multilateral and inclusive as possible. But the reality is, if you look at actors like Russia these days, and Russia has supported the Assad regime essentially uh, for, for a decade in, in illegal warfare against its own people, it's also stepped up a lot of its cooperation with Iran to increase its capacities. And Iran is doing uh, the same likewise. I think there's a growing appreciation in, in the United States, certainly, and I think an emerging bipartisan consensus still early, that Iran is not just a threat to regional order, but also the, the Islamic Republic, not, not the people, uh, um, uh, is also a, a, a broader global threat. So um, I, would, I would welcome any discussion that includes, that tries to include China because they, they clearly played an important role uh, last year in brokering the, the reestablishment of diplomatic ties between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, uh, most notably, if you see how the Saudis themselves reacted to that agreement in March of last year, they came running to the United States and said, we need a security guarantee from the United States, right? So it shows you how much they actually value in all of the hedging that's going on in the Gulf and in other places. The United States still, like it or not, remains sort of the dominant actor in part because of um, the, the broad network of partnerships. And the thing I would say on terms of rules of the game and where I think there's still um, a deficit in the Biden approach is that for all of the uh, sloganeering and rhetoric that comes from the Biden administration over the last two and a half, three years of saying it's going to put diplomacy first, I think it tried on the Iran front on the JCPOA, but it didn't have a plan B. And I think a key part of a plan B in terms of rules of the road um, would be to actually work by with and through some of these partners, especially in the Gulf, um, that have seen a self-interest in trying to de-escalate the tensions in the region. Um, I'll remind you, Paul, you and I and Alex and a few other MEI colleagues uh, wrote a report about a year or so ago that was on the theme of de-escalation. And a key node uh, that we highlighted in that analysis is the opportunity for the U.S. to step up its engagement with some of the Gulf states in its openings with Iran. And the sort of dialogues that happen with think tanks and sort of track two efforts, I, 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 you would hope that more of these are happening because otherwise this, this um, move from Israel and Iran's shadow war, uh, essentially through proxies and through terror, and through targeted strikes it could actually escalate into something bigger. And that's where I think we need a bigger idea and a theory of the case. My answer would be bring, bring in as many people that would be a constructive actors that would be constructive to setting the table for that discussion. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brian. I'm going to move in reverse order now. So back to you, Hafsa. And I know you follow Iraq very, very closely. Iraq is in the middle of a lot of, uh, you know, conflict patterns in the region. Um, how has this recent uh, escalation and the potential risk from, uh, again, another you know attack from Israel, perhaps, in retaliation for the Iranian attack, how is this being read in Baghdad? Obviously, the Iraqi prime minister is in Washington. Uh, we'll be meeting with him uh, later this week. He met with the president. Uh, how is this being seen and read in uh, in Iraq? 
Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's actually very interesting because you haven't had, you know, we've had maybe some fits and bursts, particularly uh, with the first uh, assassination, um, which uh, occurred in, I think, late December, early January of a Hashid uh, leader in, in, in Iraq. But interestingly, there hasn't been this march to war beating war dramas as maybe a few years ago we would have expected or seen or in terms of massive retaliation. And there is, I think, in Iraq this uh, general, and it's a sort of two, three years old, this attempt at least to desecuritize all the politics and try to uh, you know emerge out of 20 years since the US invasion and, and try and, and build something. You know, the prime minister, yes, of course, from the political wing of uh, the uh, the sort of uh, Shia bloc that's allied or in tandem with the uh, various uh, militias and forces, however, has been working with uh, branches of the US government, has been working with international organizations, is trying to encourage investment. The capital city is thriving and rebuilding. So I think that at, more than at any point in the last 20 years, you have an Iraqi uh, constituency, people, uh, obviously, of course, I'm not talking about Erbil Baghdad and the various internal issues that are ongoing between uh, Kurdistan and 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 and, uh, and Baghdad. But you have a general sense that, you know, nobody wants to really get into this fight right now and they don't want it and they don't really want a part of it. However, one of the major things that something like this, as you know, Issues like this have always regularly raised uh, with uh, with any prime minister, and it's always the top line with the security. But more, I think, now than ever, there is this question of the U.S. forces and their presence in the country. And I think part of the problem that Washington has when it chooses to uh, uh, sort of brush off this conversation is to ignore uh, the real need for a real fundamental question about why there are still thousands of U.S. troops inside Iraq and to what end and uh, for what gain. Um, also, in terms of, you know, yes, of course, there's training and everything, but genuinely sort of what is the security element, the presence, the last thing, any of these Levantine countries, uh, you know, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, any of these countries in this part of the region want is to become the new playground. Certainly a country like Iraq has been that playground for so many years and finally is trying to emerge through its longest period without real major conflict. And it's an opportunity that really you would hope Washington and arguably Tehran would jump on to try and prevent the escalation. My fear, and I think many people in Iraq fear that once again, the easiest playground for a conflict where the US would be dragged in would be Iraq uh, and or uh, Lebanon, depending on America's uh, America's decision uh, on whether it engages or not proactively with the Israelis. But just a final point, and sorry for taking so long, you know, this idea, and, and I, I don't necessarily discount these ideas of, you know, uh, marching closer to uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, peace, tolerance, normalization, all these kinds of words that we use. And I do agree with Brian and, and we're friends, so we're not going to fight um, offline over this. <laughs> but, you know, what I would say is, this region is fundamentally so different. I cannot, in my wildest, you know, scenario, sensationalist kind of plans, conflict or non-conflict, imagine that we are going to go back to these track two structures where we sit, you know, side by side and talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the same way, where we're going to see foreign leaders traveling to Israel or having Israeli leaders travel openly to the Gulf as if nothing has happened, where we're going to see Arab leaders not have to question or respond to this idea of accountability. Tens of thousands of Palestinians are dead. And we're talking possibly six figures once everything is recovered. This region doesn't put that back in a box. Nobody puts that back in a box. And unless we're going to start dealing with our reality, dealing with how, you know, how do we re-engage? How do we coexist? How do we start talking about concrete confidence building measures that can at least get us back into the same rooms as one another? I think we're relying far too much on conventional policies that we would have deployed in 2014 during the Gaza war or in 2021 during Sheikh Jarrah and Gaza war that simply do not apply at this moment. And I think that goes on all sides. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hafsa. Nimrod, let me go to you. And, and 
asked, uh, you know, how do you think this does affect the war in Gaza? Uh, what are the, does it change the calculation? Does it change the politics? Do you think the Netanyahu government will, you know, see their renewed kind of warm relations with the U.S. and others as an opportunity to go ahead and do the operation in Rafah despite uh, what all might happen? Or do you think it will cause uh, slowing down? Might it affect the negotiations? How do you see uh, this attack uh, affecting, uh, as Hafsa said, the real, you know, uh, crisis and tragedy in the, in the region, which has uh, been going on in Gaza? What's your read on that? It is linked, of course. And the fact that the Israeli-Iran confrontation is not a standalone issue, but it is within the context of all kinds of different fights, uh, fighting fronts, and able to enlarge the pie, let's say, of Israeli reactions and international responses. First, I would say that those track tours and joint tables and conversation, I think they are ongoing. So this is happening. You know, Israeli and Arab officials are coordinating. What we hear behind the scenes from Arab colleagues you know, is sometimes different than what is said publicly. It doesn't mean that there is not a lot of concern about the plight of the Palestinians and the suffering in Gaza, but the joint interests are at play. And I think that the moment if and when we get to a different Israeli coalition, different Israeli prime minister, even if it is someone from the Israeli right, doors will once again open very quickly for him to hold meetings in the region and beyond. We saw that with Naftali Bennett, command a settler leader coming to be prime minister and being accepted all over the region as the savior. So the criticism is very personal on Netanyahu, and I think the US is taking the lead in framing that in, that, in such a way. And if within six to nine months there will be a different Israeli prime minister. Again, it won't be a peacenik one, but maybe something, someone more reasonable or pragmatic, I think it will be welcome. More concretely and more immediately to your question, Paul, I think the content that you spoke about multilateral diplomacy, uh, we see a failure of diplomacy because we heard President Biden, I think it was almost two months ago, spell out the almost immediate ceasefire to take effect in Gaza. Okay, and we see how much the US has been investing in a six week pause in fighting. Uh, which didn't happen you know, before Ramadan, after Ramadan, it didn't happen. It shows a bit of the lack of leverage that American diplomacy, even if coming from the upper echelon of the administration, has or does not have. What that means in practice, now with the pause in fighting for hostage release deal probably out of the books or off the table, Israel will have to take action. So I think you will see increased preparation for a Rafa operation, and maybe after you know, Passover next week, uh, we already had indications of that. But if Israel takes the restraint that the Americans expected uh, on Iran, you may see more flexibility in American messaging and leeway for Israel to do its operation in Rafah in a way that falls in line with American red lines, also with Egyptian red lines, because the concerns are not only in Washington, they're also in Cairo. So I think now that it's clear that the hostage return, which is a priority for Israel, does not come through this pause in fighting, Israel will try to do that via other means. Uh, thank you, Nimrod. Uh, we're running uh, short of time, so a couple of questions, one to you and one to uh, General Nagata. Uh, Alex, my question to you is, uh, how do you think in the politics of Iran, uh, the different types of retaliation that Israel might undertake, uh, whether obviously it could be against uh, proxies in the region, one, you know, maybe that's you know more easy for the regime to deal with, but if Israel indeed strikes uh, targets inside Iran, uh, maybe with forewarning, without loss of life. Uh, uh, I imagine that will create a rally around the flag, uh, you know, dynamic in, in Iran might, that might even benefit uh, the regime politically. Uh, how do you see things uh, depending on what type of Israeli attack might occur? Thanks, Paul. I, I, if I had to speculate and guess, I would say the Israelis are probably unlikely to hit Iran on its soil right now because they have this strategic leverage right now, so much sympathy. Why squander it? Uh, and they're better off for practical reasons also to aim for what Israel fears the most, the, the Iranian proxy network in the region that are closest to, to Israel. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, even if there was an Israeli strike, on Iranian soil that was limited, more symbolic, say a Revolutionary Guards base, a missile factory, nothing too strategic or sensitive. 
Then I think the Iranian regime are masters of of sort of in terms of stepping down and saying, you know, the, we got phone calls from various heads of state asking us, please don't do anything for the sake of the region. And we are going to do that. So, I mean, we've seen that from from the regime in the past. So that's another option for him to, to sort of end this, if you will. But, Paul, I just wanted to say this whole last week or the last uh, two weeks, I should say, has, in my uh, view, created an opportunity here, not just for the Iranian leadership, that, by the way, we shouldn't forget, is essentially going through a succession process with the uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei turning 85 this month of April. Those people that are going to uh, prepare themselves to pe stay in positions of power, they need to sort of think hard about where they want to go once Khamenei is gone. Because no doubt about it, Khamenei for the last 35 years really set the course in this direction. A new leadership at the very top can mean a different direction. And this is an opportunity for him, at least to start thinking along those lines. There are reports here in Washington, folks talking about regime change, talking about more sanctions, or, or talking about something else. I would say regime change. I'm not for it. I'm not against it. But as an analyst, I say, I don't see anyone doing the heavy lifting, preparing for it. If that's what ultimately ends up being what the US and allies want, then you need to see some serious action on that front, much more so than we've seen recently. Sanctions are not going to do it. We've had so many sanctions put on Iran. That's not going to change the trajectory. That's just, that's an easy way out of dealing with a very challenging adversary. But there is a third opportunity, which, to, which is to sort of start messaging internationally and in the region. I think Arab countries have a serious role to play here, which is to say to Iran, please just overall change your relations with the Arab world. Overhaul it. Look at the Arab world, not, not as a place that is full of security threats to Iran, but full of potential opportunities, right? I think that's the sort of uh, message, uh, if one can get it right, uh, it would certainly go down really well with Iranian public opinion, but maybe even the leadership in waiting post Ali Khamenei that can see forever war is not a recipe for the Islamic Re Republic survival. So maybe they will come to their senses and start without being humiliated, without saying so in so many words, but start thinking and preparing the ground for a different direction going forward. But let me stop there, Paul. Thank you, Alex. Uh, very good advice. <laughs> If they were to follow it, it would uh, uh, help uh, de-escalate things in the region. Uh, General Nagata, let me sort of end with you and maybe ask you a bit of a question about, in a way, the politics of military deployment, uh, which you hinted at, that it's a very expensive, it's a very large deployment. Uh, and if you pull back, uh, you know, the U.S. has been fending off attacks from Iran's proxies. Uh, from Iraq and Syria, and then U.S. retaliated a while ago, still fighting with the Houthis over the Red Sea, uh, and now uh, having to deal directly uh, in coordination or in defense of Israel uh, with a direct attack uh, from Iran. Uh, the politics, you know, in general, and we are, you know, in an election year, the U.S. public is not very excited about, you know, U.S. presence uh, in the Middle East in general. Uh, the U.S. presence in Iraq is precarious. The U.S. presence in Syria is precarious. Maybe the larger naval presence in the Persian Gulf, Red Sea, and the Mediterranean is not precarious. Uh, but with this uh, uh, latest escalation, uh, also, which we haven't put on the table, that you're dealing with an Iran, which is also apparently going towards uh, nuclear capacity, potentially. So these missiles, uh, which were all conventional, if you imagine the nuclear warhead or two, it's a very different uh, uh, dynamic. So how do you see inside the U.S. the politics of America's very large military deployment in the region, uh, given these all these different dynamics? How do you see it likely to play out this year? How might it play out differently if uh, Trump were to come to office or in a second Biden administration? Uh, what would be some thoughts? Well, I think realize we're almost out of time here. So I, I, the, there's so many rabbit holes I could go down here, but so I'm just going to pick one. Um, the the tension the United States now faces, the, the political leaders and heads of agencies and departments of the U.S. government face between what we have proclaimed as our priority great power competition wherein Russia and China are the most dangerous actors and that is where our money, our people and our attention is going to go. 
But over the course of the last three years, what we've seen is the the spike in instability, conflict, and violence in the Middle East has thrown an enormous monkey wrench into that <laughs> desire, that, that trajectory that our government had purported to follow. So what I think is going to have to happen is one of two things. Either there's going to have to be an internal reckoning to re-sort our priorities so long as we believe the Middle East remains important. And I can't see how we don't conclude that. That would be what I hope happens. What I fear will happen is we will languish in what where we are now. This is my personal opinion, where we are so internally conflicted about proclaimed priorities versus priorities that have been thrust upon us that we make no decision at all. And then we essentially seed influencing the future to other actors. Thanks, Mike, for choosing one out of many rabbit holes. And thank you. Uh, I mean, thank you to all the panelists, Brian, Alex, Nimrod, Hafsa, and uh, Mike. Uh, thank you to the audience that joined us on Zoom and, and on YouTube. Obviously, this is a very open conversation. Uh, we might see each other again in a few days uh, on another event after potentially an Israeli uh, response. Uh, we're very aware uh, that the, the the bloodshed in Gaza remains the most, by far, the most urgent uh, thing that needs to uh, attract our attention. And we hope that the Israeli-Iranian escalation, which so far uh, has been limited, and it's uh, certainly in its loss of life, but the risk that it spreads through the region is very wide, and we hope that does not occur, uh, particularly so that attention can be focused on ending the war in Gaza, uh, which in itself is a very valuable goal, but will also de-escalate tensions uh, with Iran, with Iran's proxies in the region in general, uh, in addition to being morally, uh, morally necessary. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we hope things don't turn uh, uh, dramatically bad in the next few days, and we'll hope to see you at another event. Thank you very much.